So we're going to ask, how do we keep our children safe online? Now, of course, the debate has kicked off partly in, in the media with the, the, with the mail campaign, but has also been spurred on by TalkTalk's uh, decision to offer a new product uh, and, and, a, and a new proposition, and contrary to where their industry body stands as well. But there's obviously a lot of pressure on ISPs and search engines, and there's a government consultation. With me this morning, I'll start at the end. You, you may well know everybody on the panel, but I'll introduce everybody anyway. Sarah Hunter is head of UK public policy at Google. Next to Sarah is Amanda Patel from the Daily Mail. Uh, Andrew Heaney is executive director for strategy and regulation at TalkTalk, Talk, who are now offering these anti-porn filters uh, to their customers um, at the point of entry, if you like, to the, to the household. Uh, and, uh, and on the end next to me, Kirsty Hughes is the new chief executive, newish chief executive uh, of Index on Censorship. So let's begin, Amanda, with you, because it's your paper that's been leading the campaign. I mean, what, what is your proposition? What do you really want and why? Well, Christian, the, the Daily Mail has a very long and proud tradition in defending civil liberties, and freedom of speech is one of those. So this is quite at odds to many of the things that we campaigned for for a long time. But if anyone thinks that, um, that child pornography, that children viewing pornography on the internet is not a problem, I suggest all they do is get onto your phones now and, and look into and, and get up Pornhub, which I did last night. And it is just full of the most debasing, sadomasochistic pornography that no child should ever see. And there's no lock, there's, there's no requirement to, of proof of age, there's um, no credit card details you have to provide. Anyone can access this. And we now live in a society, it will change, but at the moment, most parents who have children around the age of, you know, five, six, seven, eight, when they're starting to get onto the internet, they're in their late 30s and their 40s, and they're like me. They're, they're idiots with technology. You know, if there's a problem when they get a computer, they get the kids to set it up. And we do not have the skills to stop our children from accessing these things. So what do you want? We want to have um, an opt-in. So every time, every, every piece of, um, every smartphone, every iPad, everything that you bring into the home, when you register with it, it has an opt-in. So you have to say that no, in, no pornography is going to be allowed access onto that piece of machinery. Um, Andrew, you're going somewhere towards this at Talk Talk. Can you yeah. explain what you're, what you're offering and why? Yeah, I mean, um, I absolutely agree with that. I, my, my main qualification probably to sit on the panel, I've got five children. Um, absolutely agree that it's right that we need to, to block this content. We think there's a bit of a danger of conflating two issues. There's one which is, should network based filters be offered, and the other question is about default on, default off. We offer a network-based filter. We think that's a great thing for parents, not all parents, but for some parents, it's a great way. I use it. It's a great way of managing what the children can see. We don't see that as censorship. It's about choice. The problem comes about when you step over the Rubicon and you go into having a default on, and I, I, I won't, I'm sure Kirsty will talk to it a lot more eloquently than me, but you suddenly then step over the line into censorship, you step over the line into a slippery slope to more and more content. So from our perspective, we think customers should be offered network-based filters, but we don't think that they, they should be a default block on for blocking porn. Um, and that's what we're doing at the moment. We're working basically to make more and more of our customers aware of the filters so they can take the choice themselves. And, and, and what you're offering is basically one, one set of controls that, that does every device, so there's no software yeah. or anything like yeah, that. Basically, it's about a, a one or two minute setup. You turn it on, you say which categories of, of uh, content you want blocked, whether it's porn, suicide, self-harm sites, and then that blocks it for the whole of all of the devices on the network. You can tailor it, you can have black, black lists and white lists. Uh, basically, it's, it's a very easy choice for a customer to turn on what they want for them. And who, but, who, who, who does the list on what's beyond the pale? Well, we use a third party list for a company called Semantic. Uh, but if a customer doesn't like the list, they can easily turn it off, or they may decide to add another website to it and blacklist something else, or whitelist another site. So it's quite flexible. Um, again, it's all about putting, putting parents and customers in control. Okay, Kirsty, wh why are both things wrong? Um, I, I think we're, we're at real risk of, of in, inhibiting our own freedom of speech here. And I think just to step back briefly, we've, we've got to remember freedom of speech is a fundamental, a fundamental right. And I would just say, first of all, beware the company we keep. If we look around 
the world and the most censorious countries. Before we even get to the Chinese firewall, we're talking about Syria, North Korea, we're talking about Uzbekistan. Um, my, my second key point, which is answering your, your question, first of all, we're talking about blocking legal content. We're not talking about illegal content. Child porn is not the same as adult content, legal adult content, which, which is available in our society. So I think it is a slippery slope. You risk crossing a Rubicon. I think there are two, two questions to, to add to that. One is, who decides what is blocked? Who puts together these lists? Because this is a form of censorship. And I think there's been a lot of research done on this. And a lot of res that research suggests you cannot put these filters on without pulling all sorts of other sites, also legal sites, into, into your list. And, th and there was an example came out in a, an LSE report this week of, of mobile filters that were actually ending up blocking the British National Party site. That wasn't the aim. It's the, whatever one thinks of its views, it's a legal political party. Um, and my last big question, I think, on this would be, um, does, it, does it work? Does it work? Do we keep our children safe only by rules or only by filters? I think you need uh, active parenting. You need active parental choice. And, and we've already heard, I think, a contradiction because we've said parents apparently are incapable of turning on filters at the level of their own computer, but they can cope with going to this network level filter potential censorship and adjust it and tweak it. And I think there is a big difference between network level filters and what you choose to do on a particular computer at home. Network level filters can be turned on across the whole network or across the whole society in a country where there's a one, one network. And so we're talking about putting legal communication information out, either out of bounds or something you have to turn on to be part of that legal free world. Uh, Amanda, I'll come to you in a moment, Sarah, but Amanda, just, just take that point head on. I mean, aren't you setting a great example to dictatorships around the world as soon as you go down this road? Look, as I've, I've, already, I've said earlier, Christian, that you know, we are not the kind of newspaper that believes in, um, in stripping people of their civil liberties. You know, we, we are not. But this has just got to such a level now. I mean, you were mentioning um, the LSC. Well, they also had um, a report which said that um, that now that 22% of boys aged 13 to 16 and 30% of girls have seen sexual images online and 2% of them had seen violent sexual images. We have to find a way to stop this from happening. And these aren't, you know, poor kids in council estates with bad parenting. These are mostly middle-class parents, middle-class families who are not um, technically literate enough. I mean, of course they tell their children not to see these things, not to watch them, but they're in their room with their computers. And, you know, they're curious, and, and I think that they, these images, I've seen them. These are so damaging. I found them distressing. Um, but, but this is why your position, when you say we're not in favour of censorship, well, actually, you are. You're this, saying things are so bad that we're now in favour of censorship. There are times, I think, when you're protecting children when censorship is appropriate, and I think this is a time. I'm not saying for a second that these kind of images should be blocked from Internet sites at all. But it's just we have to find a way that, to make it easier for parents to block them from children seeing them. Sarah, what does Google think of what TalkTalk Talk have done, and would you do the same? Well, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll start by surprise everyone saying I actually agree with Amanda, um, <coughs> which may be the first and last time we, we agree with each other. <laughs> um, well, no, what, what I agree with it is that, is that we, Google, also believe that children shouldn't be seeing pornography online. We, we, I think it's really worth saying that up front, is that none of us, and I think none of us on this panel, want children to be unsafe online. We don't disagree on that. What we disagree upon is the mechanisms by which we protect our children. Uh, and so the second thing I'd say, and, and Google probably are, are, are very well placed to say this, uh, is that it's not that easy. Um, a lot of the solutions that are being discussed are not perfect. Um, I think Kirsty set out a lot of the problems with, with network filters. But there are other problems about the extent to which we, we almost de-skill parents by giving them simple solutions that actually aren't simple and are not perfect. A lot of the filters that are used are either overblock or underblock. And there's a risk that we create environments where we tell parents there are easy answers and there aren't easy answers. 
Um, so actually what we think is the most important thing we should be doing is, is skilling parents up, really making a lot of more effort, frankly, than we've done in the past, to making sure parents really do know uh, the risks that children face online, and we give them as many tools as possible to protect their children. That's what we think is, is the most effective way to, to make this sort of difference. And did you just accept that a clever teenager can always get around this stuff? Oh, oh, oh absolutely. It's not a silver bullet. And I, I, the other thing is, I, I, I agree with Sarah that we shouldn't lull people into the full sense of the security that says, if you turn on this button, job done, you've done your job as a parent. No, I mean, it's one of many things. But that's what you're appealing to, isn't it, really? No, we're, we're not trying to appeal, and we, uh, absolutely we're not trying to oversell it. We're just saying this is a tool in a, in, a, in a toolbox of different things. You might want to put device-based filters on as well. You might want to make sure that the computer or the laptop is always in the lounge so you can see what's happening. But there's different things for different parents. What was, our point is you shouldn't deny parents what this tool, which we think is a very good tool, if people want to use it, um, then they should be, have the option of using it. I, I think banning it or, or, or saying, no, you can't have the option of using that tool, we just think is the wrong approach. I do want to bring you all into this debate as well. So, and you can obviously do it through Twitter uh, on Big Tent UK, and I can see your questions. Or if you want to ask them directly, then do just stick your, your hands up uh, straight away. Uh, Mark Stevens, hand goes up at, right, right at the back. Um, microphone number three. I, I got the impression that you're talking past each other. Um, I think Kirst is the only one to have quite rightly drawn attention to the fact that um, there is a difference between legal and illegal content. And I think that you have to, have to deal with that. The suggestion that um, we're protecting our children in some way that Amanda makes is, is frankly idle. Um, everybody in this room, I suspect, saw pornography of its day, whether it was Penthouse or Rass Russell, uh, Hustler or Razzle or whatever it was, uh, it, under the bedclothes when they were teenagers, underage. All that we're doing is seeing our children move online. Now, if we can protect our children from the illegal stuff online, that's fine. But uh, it's clearly impossible. So how, how do you deal with that? Amanda? Um, I, I have to say that I think that... Um, that there's absolutely no comparison between the kind of stuff we saw as children and what they're seeing now. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. But so you saw you... porn as a kid too, did you? No, I used to... I, my brothers had Playboy. <coughs> what were your favourites? My brothers yeah. had... I, I had... Um... <laughs> I, my brother said Playboy. I had Dolly magazine, which taught me how to be a good kisser. That's about as that's about as pornographic yeah, as it got for me. That's not to get you sacked from the Daily Mail. But, um, but, but, but Chris, <laughs> Chris, there is a really important point here. Um, that, uh, and I don't want to go into this too um, graphically, but you have to be graphic to make the point to some degree. The first thing I clicked on last night on this um, porn hub, it was um, a picture of a woman being stripped by um, a Nazi-looking officer, bound up with her hands and her wrists behind her back, um, then forced to perform oral sex on another woman while she was sodomized and the woman urinated in her mouth. Now, that is completely accessible. I went on to some of the other ones. They were grotesque. This is not, you know, a Playboy centerfold, I promise you. The, the, the legal pornography, and I, I stress again, I don't care if people want to watch this. I just want to try and find some way, and I know it's not easy. I just want to try and find some way to help parents to protect Kirsten, their children from it. Kirsten, you want to just it. come back? Yeah, I think it's about, we've heard already that it's actually, it, it can give you a false sense of security, that it's not a silver bullet, that actually it requires all sorts of active parenting, different decisions in different households about where you put computers and, and so on. And so we do have a problem here. It is legal. So unless we're going to introduce censorship in a democratic society, we, we have to look at the complexity of the issue. We don't deal with child road accidents by banning all cars. We've got to figure out ways that keep children safe in different ways for different families, but that allow our society to function as a democracy that adults live in as well. I mean, Andrew, if people wanted different kinds of filters, would you offer that? Political filters, morality filters? Um, I think you always you know, where, 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 where do you sort of drop the line? I think well, that's I'm, interesting I'm, I'm, thing about the talk, talk. Let me give you an Sorry. example. We offer something called homework time that using the same technology that allows during four till six o'clock every evening for you to block access to game sites and social networking sites. Again, it's optional, but that's about parental choice. But it's, it's about not always about parents, is it? Because it might be a husband blocking a wife. Fine, but that's or... about a grown-up that's about a grown-up conversation between two adults. But it's also 
about countries, because other countries look to what we're doing and say, well, you can't tell us off in Turkey or India or Pakistan because you're doing it here. And it, it often gets into religion, uh, politics, and at network level, again, it's really about censorship. I think censorship. you're conflating here so censorship with choice. Censorship, as we know, and you use the examples well, of North you, Korea. You are censoring your children, aren't you? You're all saying yeah. it's right to censor your children. Well, it's just that when they're children, it becomes a parental choice, not censorship. But uh, as a parent, I'm, I'm continually working out what my kids can and can't do all the time. So uh, if you want to call That's that censorship... That's why I'm saying, let's stop this pretense of we're all against censorship. You are in favour of censorship. It's just where you draw the lines around Well, and I think it's about who does it. We're saying parents can do it, but what we're not saying is that ISPs or the state should do it. You are doing it because you're doing it at network level and presumably, unless I've got this wrong, for any household that says, yes, please, uh, I want to opt into that, that's the whole household. Anything they Google as an adult or, or search in any other way is, is going to have a real limitation on what they see. And we're not just talking about that they can't then see porn. They, they're not going to see some art sites. They may suddenly find that we're on the list because we're discussing pornography on our index site. It's proved again and again. These so, filters are crude. I, I, was just, I mean, I was just going to sort of refer back to the talk talk um, uh, network level filter which actually does have it's more than adult content on your filter I'm right and it's that it's also suicide sites and and so uh, sort of and I, and I do think there is a you know I, I'm all for parental choice I do think that's that's at the heart of, of a successful uh, filter at a, at a device level frankly um, but I think when you have companies making decisions about what is and isn't appropriate for children, uh, not legal or illegal, but what is and isn't appropriate, I think we get into very difficult territories because what may be appropriate in your house may not be appropriate in my house. And if we pretend that all families are the same and all families have a similar level of, of, of moral rights and wrongs, then we get into very, very difficult territory, I think. That's right. I think we're talking about privatisation of free expression. And we've actually had two British government reports in the last four years into this. And both of them said this should be parental choice at device level in the home. So, so why has it suddenly changed again? Yeah, yeah, let me just bring in this gentleman here. David Alexander from MyDex. Uh, we work on behalf of individuals. I think there's some very interesting points here. I am a father of an eight-year-old as well, and I consider myself reasonably tech savvy. But the thing that's missing is personalisation here. At the end of the day, the context of a person's life, what devices I use, who I am, whether or not I'm an adult or a minor, are completely missing from this discussion. Sarah's absolutely right. There are lots of network layer filtering systems that I as a parent can use that are independent of my ISP, that transcend location, that allow me to control what my son sees on his iPad or what he sees on his horrible DS something or other. And it just filters it, but it's my choice as a parent because I'm responsible for that child and I'll do the best I can for them. But I don't have to have my ISP making those choices for me. I can take control. So I think the point about education is terribly important. Do you think there are many people like you, though, who would be I able to do I don't think it? there are, but we're working very hard with a number of other people to make that personalisation and context exist online so that a child or an adult can have exactly what they want and, but control it without having to be a bloody rocket scientist. Okay, thanks. Down here, number one. Hi there. Um, Amanda says the Mail's leading this campaign um, <laughs> against porn online. I've just gone into Mail online right now. Um, <clears throat> no, I just wanted to know how you're leading this campaign. Here's, here's just one of the things. Sizzling chemistry. First trailer for The Great Gatsby shows Leonardo DiCaprio and Kerry Mulligan in steamy sex scene. Watch the video now. I think you rather make my point for me. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I wouldn't have a problem with my um, kids seeing that. It's uh, what I would have a problem with if it was something like Pornhub. And there's a complete difference. And, um, you know, I hardly think that, that Leno DiCaprio is going to be, you know, tying um, Daisy up in bondage in The Gatsby. That's fine, that's horrible, as if it's there not a shades, spectrum. There are but, shades but of grey. But it's a spectrum, I'm and afraid you're going to... But, there, but you're just drawing the line in a particular point, which is with legal content, but where? And we all have different points where we draw that line. Yes. Is that Glenna? No. Yes, it is. <laughs> Graham Linehan. For people to do with... Uh, for people to do, if they have a computer open, is do a, a search on the Mail Online for the term all grown up because that is a code word for children who've recently come of age and uh, it's now possible to have sex with them. That's what the term all grown up means for male online. 
I'm not entirely sure what you... What, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't actually understand what you're just, saying. Just are flesh you saying out that, what you're saying. If you do a search for the, the term all grown up, the Mail Online regularly does articles about child stars who are now 16. Right. And they use the term all grown up, and it's usually a very salacious piece that shows the, ch the, the now adult in revealing clothes. That's what all grown up means. It means this person is now available to have sex with. And this so is supposed I, to be something I, that we invented. This is, um, this is just I'm just saying that it's quite it? ironic that you are running that campaign. <coughs> there, there, there is that sense, isn't there, that people think there's a double standard here, that you're happy to titillate, you're happy to you know, do very well on Mail Online with pictures of women in bikinis and all the rest of it, but you get very outraged about pornography. It's, I mean, um, Christian, just it's, address it's that. very easy. It comes back to the situation. It's, <coughs> about, um, it's about helping parents um, who are not computer literate like the gentleman who spoke before. And, and most of our, uh, the, our readers, the adults aren't. Their children are much more sophisticated with IT than any form of IT than they are. And, and it is, it's, it's, a, it's a way of just trying to get, give them the facility to be able to block the things which are gross. And, and you know, I completely support but I think it. this is very, a very strange argument because how illiterate are parents if the computer is there, they're, they're turning it on, there's always some very simple setups. Because what you're actually saying, because I'm not saying there shouldn't be filters that a parent can turn on at home. I'm saying we shouldn't have a default switch on, so we're actually putting adults and all computers, the entire population, into a child zone, uh, blocking out legal uh, sites, including a lot of sites that won't actually be pornography, all on what argument that, that it's, too hard, it's too hard for them? And we've already heard that if it's too hard for them, it's going to be a false reassurance. Isn't the slight elephant in the room here, Sarah, that pornography is a big driver of the internet in terms of financing? Uh, I mean, how, how much money do you think Google makes out of pornography? I have no idea, I'm afraid. But Quite I don't, a lot. It's, well, I don't think it necessarily is... I mean, but let's put it like this. We don't go out of our way to try and make money out of pornography. Um, but you'll take but it there is, there. Well... Like all search engines, we do allow advertisers to, to place adverts alongside searches that show adult content. Um, but it's legal. I mean, let's just be clear. These automated systems enable people to advertise against legal content. I, I don't see a problem with that. Um, as long as we put in place sufficient safeguards as much as we can for children. Um, and I think, I mean, there, there is an element of... of, of de-skilling parents here and actually creating this sort of strange world where we think children are safe but they're actually not. I mean, Pornhub is a good example because my memory of the home safe, the TalkTalk Talk product, is for the first couple of weeks of operation, Pornhub wasn't blocked. So TalkTalk Talk parents who had said yes to the service actually were getting Pornhub was going through and it was only a parent who noticed it that made, brought it to the attention of TalkTalk Talk and they, they blocked it. So I don't... Filters are not perfect, uh, and I don't think we should create a situation where we give parents the sense that it can all be okay, because it's just not. Yes. Yeah. Hi, um, Tomas Spinner from ZDN UK. Um, I was just wondering, um, you said that, you, you just said that the, the filters aren't perfect. I was just wondering, what are the, what are the types of, of technical measures that the people are taking to get around them? Is there any way that, you, that people can counter that? And um, given that you think that they're not perfect and the government is legislating on it at the moment, do you think that legislation for opt-in for porn is ultimately futile? Sarah? I, th I, I think the, the, there's two types of, uh, of children we're trying to address here. One is the very young child who accidentally stumbles across inappropriate content. And for that, I think device-level filters, things like Safe Search, which you can switch on for, for Google, I think those, those are pretty good. Um, it's Unfortunately, for 14-year-old boys, however, there's, there's, there is a limit to how much you can protect them when they are actively seeking out pornography. Um, and so, actually, the best thing we can do is to make sure that parents sit with their children when they're very young and make sure they understand the, the rules of the internet, if you like, and understand how to navigate it safely. And then have grown-up conversations with our older children about sex, such that when they do seek out porn, they know that it's not, it, that's not what normal sexual loving relationships are. I mean, I think we, it's horses for courses, right? And, and, and children are not a universal group. But is your view that the legislation would be pointless? It would be a mistake? I think it would be a mistake, absolutely, yeah. Andrew? I mean, just I, the, the, the question about whether filters are perfect or imperfect, I think there's two, two points here. The first is, 
um, around getting the list right, and you do get underblocking and overblocking. And I think anybody who runs a list needs to make sure it's, it can be updated. Just everybody keeps on saying device is better, device is better. Well, actually, those devices use exactly the same blacklists and whitelists, et cetera. So the same problems of under overblocking apply to devices as much as they do. Uh, as, they, as they, they do to networks. The other thing is about how easy they are circumvent. It is not difficult. Um, certainly, if you're, if you're a, a savvy 14-year-old, it, it's fairly easy to get around. But we don't think that means there's no point in offering them. They do stop inadvertent viewing, and they do discourage some 14-year-olds who are pro probably not, not, not savvy. But again, we mustn't promote it as some sort of silver bullet. Done your job as a parent. You don't have to worry anymore. There's lots more that needs to be done alongside filters, whether those are device filters or network filters. And, 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 and with regard to the law, you know, what, what's your advice to the government? In, in terms of what the government... I mean, um, I think the government should be encouraging ISPs to offer it in the same way they should be encouraging device Apple and um, people to make Xboxes to make sure it's very easy. But don't easy. force them. Uh, certainly do not force them to turn default on because I think we step over this, this Rubicon into a very, very dangerous world. You know, once you go over to that, you do move her into a world of censorship. As long as you don't do that, I just don't, we're in a world of choice, we're not in a world of censorship. I really think that's, in, I'm sorry, but I think that's incredibly simplistic at network level. There's the reason we're talking about devices versus networks is the move to go from on and off to have that blocking at network level is exactly moving it to society level. And you're now saying you want government to urge ISPs to do that. So, so I, I think this is very, very dangerous territory. And I also think, uh, as I think has come up from some of the audience questions, you know, we're, we're talking about a certain degree of hypocrisy here because we're in a society that sexualizes all sorts of things, including younger, younger adults and children and, and is obsessed in a lot of our media coverage with sexual coverage and fine, that's our right as a society to, to cover these issues, not other issues. But let's not de deny that. Well, and, and what Sarah was saying about, therefore, you know, how do parents educate in the context of, of that society? And I think the point on filters, we're, we're making it sound terribly simple. Oh, you can overblock and underblock. No, there's a, a very blurred boundary here. And who is making those decisions about that site or that site. Often it, it, it's done by searching for, for certain key terms. Where, where you do you fear it will lead? Up. I mean, that's what we're, what we're kind of, mm. we just kind of keep avoiding this question of what is the consequence of going down this road? What, what is your I, deep fear? I think the, my deep fear is that the government is going to say you must put a, a filter on legal content. So we're talking about the government saying things that are legal are suddenly we're blocking your freedom of expression. It's a fundamental right. It's not an absolute right, like the right not to be tortured and killed, but it's a fundamental right uh, to have access to, to be able to share, impart, receive information, and, and it's introducing a serious, serious block. Andrew? On I just find it unusual to hear people, we know there's a problem, this is one, one, one thing that will help that problem and, and help parents, and it just, seems, it just seems that we already agree that device-based filters are a good thing. It just seems odd that we're, we're, there's people advocating, denying parents that they should be But you're be able just not addressing the point, are you, it's sort of the consequence of this? You just, the, the, the trouble with this argument is it goes around in circles because you all keep saying, but this is a really bad problem, we've got to do something, without actually addressing the fear of where it will lead. Well, I, I think as provided you don't have a, a default on, then I don't think those fears arise. But that you're, you're making okay. it so black and white. You're saying it's crossing the Rubicon if it's on, but it's absolutely fine if it's off. It's a, it's a click of a finger. It's a click of a government decision, an ISP decision, and also in other no, countries. It's a, it's Microphone number four. Um, Sam Nagai in Cabinet Office. Um, while not expressing any particular opinion here, I think there's an assumption going on in the discussion that children looking at pornography is a bad thing. Um, I'd be interested to know if there's any evidence beyond philosophical or anecdotal um, stuff that you might have. Uh, Anybody want to pick that up? I, I think looking for evidence in, in this particular space is very difficult. I think if you look at uh, Sonia Livingston's put a blog out recently about the subject saying that actually there's lots of research but you can't ever have a control group amongst children about looking at pornography. No, no, no sensible parent is going to say, sure, test, test the effects of pornography on my seven-year-old. Um, so, so I think we're in a territory where you, you have to, uh, uh, again, we come back to it's up to parents to make individual decisions for children because, you know, who am I to tell someone else how to parent? I'm not going to, but I want to make decisions for my own children. Thank you very much. 
tell parents you can't bring your child up in this religion or in this way or as an atheist, and parents will decide the answer to your question. Yes, down here in the front. Hello. Hi, uh, Anthony Marcano from Riverglide. Um, we already have age filters on movies. Um, so if my son goes to the cinema, uh, he won't be let in to see a 15 unless he has ID to prove that he's over 15. So I don't really understand why there's such a concern about censorship if we apply that kind of filtering on age-related content as we do in cinemas and in video stores. Kirsty, do you want to pick that? Yes, yes I do. I, I, I absolutely take that point. But what I'm saying is that these filters um, are blocking across the board. If you switch this in, and I think this is what Amanda wants, correct me if it's wrong, if you say everybody who gets a computer connection in the UK has to have these default switches on, it's like saying everybody in, in the UK can't go to the cinema for over 18 films and can't go and uh, browse in a bookshop. You've, you've got to choose to be allowed into a bookshop. You've got to be aware that you're being cut off from a range of content, not just from legal pornography. I don't want to get caught up in the analogy too much, but aren't you, isn't he actually just saying, if you want to go and watch a, a movie, you've just got to prove that you're 18? Yes? I, I think you can carry your ID. I think there's a, there, there is, a, there is a, uh, a, a practical problem here, which is that the definition of pornography is not set by, you know, any age... You know, pornogra pornographic sites are not previewed by any ratings agency in given ages. So what you have is ISPs and filter companies making the list up um, and making this up in actual... Uh, quite a lot of secrecy because, of course, you don't want bad people to game the list. So, I, I, I mean, I think that the LSE research I think Kirsty referred to earlier about mobile filters that are operating at the moment, I thought was really revealing because it listed a number of sites that have been blocked by, by O2, Orange, etc. Um, and more worrying than, you know, accidentally uh, legal sites and, and appropriate sites, like church sites, for example, being blocked, was the fact that when the site owner called up the network to say, hey, unblock me, I, I, I'm completely legal, um, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what to do, you know, and, and they're still blocked. So there, there is this, this level of secrecy and lack of transparency around the way filters work that I think, if they were in a default on situation, would be terribly worrying. Amanda, um, can you just pick that? Yeah. Isn't that just something that, that you can legislate against, that you make sure it is transparent and that we know who the people are who are the censors, just like the example of movies. We know who the people are on the board of censors. We should know who the people are and the, and, and the, the things that they're blocking should be available for anyone to see. Wouldn't that I, get around that problem? I, I, I'd be interested to know why it doesn't happen at the moment. I mean, I don't know. Well, Maybe I don't know. Well, we're either. not just talking about blocking under 18s. Isn't that the whole point? We're talking about blocking for everybody and then a default switching in. So it isn't just about, well, great, let's have censorship for under 18s. Is that what we really want? It, it's about where, where our default position is as a society. Yes, down here. I, I, I was going to go to Twitter, but Big Tent UK seems to be being spammed on Twitter. So... Um... We more? may need to go to a different hashtag. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hello, um, Adam G, Channel 4. Um, I'm always surprised in these discussions how little uh, education is um, discussed. I mean, Sarah did touch uh, upon it for a minute and used the E word. Um, but I know as, as a parent myself, my main um, priority is to educate my children what to do when they come across this kind of material because they inevitably are going to one way or another. So could we just talk a little bit about what the role of educating children in that, in that sort of regard actually is? Well, what do you think? I, th I think that, you know, that's the number one priority is to make sure that they're able to handle it, um, to talk about it, to know what to, they do when they come across stuff that disturbs them. Um, and I also think it's really important to explain to them um, that... Uh, the way this sort of material is presented online, it sort of normalizes everything and not everything is normal. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's so often trotted out that people forget it actually means something, educating parents. And we spend a lot of time and money trying to push out materials to parents. And I don't know if you saw last year, we did a big campaign called Good to Know, which had lots of adverts in the tube. In fact, if you live in London, you couldn't miss it, frankly. Uh, trying to give parents useful tips for how to keep themselves safe on like, parents and grown-ups. Uh, and you know, some of the, the advice is around protecting your children. And 800, over 800,000 people clicked on the website to, to, to find out more. So there clearly is a gap. 
uh, and a demand from parents uh, to, to get the kind of tech-savvy awareness that, that their children have. I, I do think we're in a slight sort of generational shift here, which is certainly I, I grew up without the internet, and I consider myself tech savvy, but my son is a brilliant user of the iPad. It's just incomparable, our, our levels of knowledge. But you know, when, when our children become children, I, I am confident that both the technology will advance sufficiently, but also the levels of knowledge will advance sufficiently. And we, just, we are the generation that frankly is at sea on this one. Uh, I was talking more about educating um, children, not educating adults. Uh, yet, well, I mean, I, again, I think parents are in charge of educating their children. Some stuff happens at schools, uh, but often teachers are the least confident, and, and in schools where pretty much everything useful is blocked, you can't really, I mean, it's like teaching a child to swim in an empty swimming pool, you know, at school, it's impossible. Um, whereas, actually, I think parents have much more of a responsibility about educating their children online than, than teachers do in this regard. I think the, the gentleman's absolutely right there, and it is the, the duty of any parent. You sound like a very um, devoted parent, but not every parent is. You know, half of the marriages in this country are breaking up at the moment. You know, parents are going different ways. Children are out of that very secure environment, sometimes just for a short time. But, you know, you need, and it is crucial to be able to tell your children, if you stumble upon a picture like this of a woman trussed up like a chicken being sodomised by a mechanical okay. penis, yes. that is, you know, that is, not, that is not normal. It's distressing for them, and you have to be able to talk them through all that. Um, and at that, at that is this crucially Kirsty. important. But it is yeah. just true that we, we, we've got a generational problem here. I think, and but, uh, why I... should the kids suffer? Because people like me can't use the internet properly. Can we broaden out this education point a bit? Because I think it's a very important one. There's education about things that you as a parent, or a lot of us might agree, we, we don't want them to see that, or if they see it, we'd like them to react in this way or that. What about education to be citizens in a democratic society? What about educating people about freedom of expression when what was declared as obscene a hundred years ago turned out you know, to, to be fought for as artistic freedom of expression, fighting against, you know, it was until the end of the 60s that all plays were censored uh, or had the, had the potential to be censored and reviewed by the government in the UK. So some, what about feeling uncomfortable? What about, you know, if we were having a, a broader argument about freedom of expression, religion, the right to offend, the fact that you've got to be, if you're defending freedom of expression, you've got to defend the right of the BMP or views you don't agree with to be heard. So I think that's got to be part of this, and the, okay. the art point is not a small We're point. in the last couple of minutes, so I just want to take a few views from the audience without coming back to the panel. So yes, over here first, and then over here. Hi, <clears throat> uh, it's Marco Batozzi uh, from Viviki. I just, uh, Kirsty, I can imagine if you were in the drugs debate, you would be the one saying that anyone who has a joint is going to be a crack addict um, straight away. Because I feel like we're jumping from a simple question of if you porn was in front of your kid, would you let them watch it or not? If the answer is no, then all we're really talking about is a shorthand way of at least trying to capture some of that. And, and one of the debates is what, what else are you blocking, whether it be the people or the content. So if you search for, you know, if you search for blowjob, I'm not sure what content you're going to miss out on that really is going to be of great value to that particular search. Secondly, from a user perspective... Just briefly, please, because I want to get a couple of other people in as well. From a user perspective, you're talking about a family, right? So you're talking about blocking adults and adults. I can have that conversation with my wife. I don't know... You know, there's only four or five of us in a household, so I'm not sure why you can't just have that debate about what's being blocked or not within your household. OK, thank you. Over here. My name's e Evo Burham. I'm from Australia. We um, are running mobile journalism workshops throughout the country to mainstream media and also to uh, schools. I'm finding that education, we're finding that education is probably the best filter. We're actually showing uh, young people what they can do with these devices beyond just becoming consumers of content. So they're actually creating their own real content that's addressing the issues of citizenship and um, more than citizen witnessing, addressing issues of citizen journalism and stuff. So we're, um, there are ways to do it. that You can be proactive about this. And in some of the schools where we're doing this, they're actually taking some of the filters down because students themselves are filters. And uh, I think it was, please excuse me, I think it was Kirsty before that mentioned um, hypocrisy, the word hypocrisy. I think it's a little hypocritical to be talking about this without having a teenager up there on stage as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. 
Yes, this might be the last one, but yeah, go on. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Crick, a computer science academic. Um, it's a worrying trend that there's, it seems to be we're always presenting technological solutions to perceived or subjective societal or sociological problems. And I think that's, that, that this, this is a worrying trend. I think um, I'm glad education was mentioned because this is an education problem. If, we're, if there are issues we need to discuss, then let's discuss them. And also with regards to technology, then this is a digital literacy problem. So let's address that rather than trying to think of a technological solution. Can I, can I, we're, we're, we're out of time, but I just want to do a very quick show of hands uh, in, the, in, the, in the room. If you believe that the government should legislate on a, a, on a, on a, a talk talk type system, forcing people to choose, could you, could you raise your hand? I think that would be a good idea to follow talk talk's example. Okay, and if you, if you want to go further than that to, to, to the Daily Mail suggestion of an opt in to any pornography, would you raise your hand? <laughs> yes, okay. well, I think we know where you are in the room. Um, can I ask you to thank our panel very much? Thank you very much. <laughs>